the biggest challenge when I took on this role was prioritising. So we've only got a little office and hundreds of possible projects. And so I took lots of advice from both policymakers and researchers about where the evidence base was most missing from policy. And plastics sung out as one of the most pressing issues. We met the Prime Minister on Monday. We it did indeed, and it was a wonderful meeting. I think New Zealand's very lucky to have a Prime Minister like that. We didn't talk about plastics very much, and that is the thing that the Prime Minister's asked me to work on. So there's already been a law change to get rid of single-use plastic bags, yeah. but obviously it's a much bigger problem than that. And so we're putting together an evidence base, with all the boring stuff, auditing what's coming in and out of the country, and all the technical solutions. But we also have some psychologists on the panel and we're looking at ways to do some cultural transformation to get buy-in from people. And I would love to hear about what you've seen that really encourages people to buy into changing the way they interact with plastic. Well, I find that it's the young people who get on board. They have other ways of thinking. They know what we're doing to the planet, it's their future. Many of them have grown up being concerned about some of these things. So we have this program for young people called Roots and Shoots. It's in 60 countries now and it's all ages, kindergarten, university and everything in between. And I think in at least half of those 60 countries there are groups of young people working diligently on how to reduce plastic waste. And you know I have great confidence in them. They're already coming up with ideas. So you think, ask the children for the ideas and they'll come up with them themselves? Well, no, I think a lot of, a lot of um, you know, high-tech people also are coming up with ideas, but it makes you sick. I mean, I was just reading about several whales and dolphins that are washed up on the beach dead with huge amounts, tons of plastic in their stomachs. And, you know, I know in California there's been a huge fight to save the California condor, and they bred them up, but in the wild, they're picking up plastic to feed their chicks uh, because it looks like something else. Horrible, so plastic is a scourge. It's a marvellous packaging material, but it's not a good material if we want something to actually degrade back into, um, into the environment quickly. So, so, so it's got an incredibly long life. So it's efficient, it's economic. So those are the things that, those are the properties of it that make it such good packaging, but make it very, very difficult when it comes to end of life. Now the reality is that we can do something with all of this packaging. It is technically recyclable, but that gets into another whole area of do we have the capacity, do we have the capability? And the whole world's grappling with this at this moment in time. A big part of this project is that it's really broad in scope but that means we are trying to sort of shift the whole system at once, and so that's why we've spoken to so many people. We have a core panel of 11 people, and I'm involved in supporting them to provide input into our larger report. And then we've also got what we're calling a broader reference group, and that's where I'm talking to stakeholders from across the system, across New Zealand, um, to find out sort of what work they're doing in the area. Talking to Plastics New Zealand, which are the manufacturing industry body for the plastics um, industry. Speaking to uh, various brand owners or retailers, um, local councils, some community groups like Sustainable Coastlines or Parakore, who are a, a Māori organisation who have been doing waste management on marae. There are basic principles around Parakore and um, the main principle is that we return all resource back to from where it came and in the most natural process possible. Kaitiakitanga is intergenerational mātauranga or, or knowledge. So uh, when we are born, uh, much like a, a prince is groomed to become a king, um, our people are given traditional knowledge and custom and it has handed down through 
generation as Māori. Parakore is one of those pieces of knowledge. As well as all of those groups, it's getting involved with the researchers who might be looking at new materials or um, behavioural research about how new ways to use plastic or changing your practices might sort of um, spread through society. A single plastic bag ban is in operation. That's just step one of what the government wants to do in terms of avoiding waste. And so they need the evidence base that the panel can provide in order to really actively write policy. So it's quite an exciting project in that we're making a direct difference as we go. I really enjoyed the project because it's very un-ivory tower. So rather than sit in the University of Auckland with a bunch of scholars, um, we're adding in lots of people from recycling industries, councils, general public, anyone that wants to contribute. We have to eliminate unnecessary packaging. Recycling will not solve the plastics problem. Do you agree or not? Let me start with you, Mike Sammons. Um, I think the first, the first thing to do is look at reduction. So if you don't need packaging, um, don't use it, basically, and the uh, plastic bags um, action is, uh, is a case in point there, that um, we've seen that um, consumers can adapt and have adapted very well to that. So, um, yeah, what was the figure? 750 million plastic yep. bags yep. Um, a year, so that's significant. So the first thing's around reduction. Um, and then the second thing's about um, if you do, um, if you're looking for packaging, aim for it to be renewable. Um, rather than non-renewable. And then if it can't be renewable, if you can't look at a fibre-based packaging and you have to use plastic, um, ensure that that plastic um, can, I, well, in an ideal world, it will be um, recyclable, but not just recyclable, but recycled back into what it actually came from. So, um, so you've got a circular solution. What do you think, Juliet? Can we even approximate dealing with the problem by recycling? No, because even if you could do all the sorting and get people to recycle, the chemistry is still not perfect. So it will never be a circle, it will be a downward spiral. So Mike was in fact wrong, you'll always have to downcycle. <laughs> I think he's completely <coughs> wrong, so I think recycling is part of the problem and yeah, part of right. the it's, solution. It's so Here at Flight Plastics, we are reprocessing New Zealand's recycled PET plastic. Now that's the plastic with a one in the recycling logo. It's commonly used in drinks bottles and in food packaging. So water bottles, Coke bottles, all that sort of stuff. Our food packaging that we make, which is biscuit trays and, and blueberry punnets and so on. And what we're doing is we're buying, we're buying this material from the from the recycling bins around New Zealand effectively, it's coming from a um, recycling bin to a, a sorting facility. We buy the material and then we're able to clean that up, get the, rid of the glue and the labels and the cap and turn it back into a food grade product. And those food grade products, interestingly there is a blueberry punnet, that, that has been made from New Zealand recycled plastic here at flight. It's gone to a supermarket, gone to a customer, gone into a recycling bin and come back to us here at flight and we'll be able to put that back through the system and use it again. That's a circular economy. Uh, what we've been living in up till very recently is, is a, what we call a linear economy, and that is you buy something, you use it, and you throw it in the bin, and that goes to waste, and it's wasted. And, and what we're learning from this circular economy situation is that what we used to think of as rubbish, like a, a, an empty water bottle, is actually not rubbish, it's a resource. The key to recycled plastic in New Zealand and using recycled plastic is that it actually creates a double benefit. We're not importing material, so we're not spending you know, our overseas earnings buying this stuff. We're not shipping it here, so there's no carbon issues like that. And, and more than that, we're taking it from our own waste stream, using it here in New Zealand, making a product that we can use again and again. It's really exciting that the PET recyclers have led the way in New Zealand and now we're at more than capacity. So we can take in the PET recycling plants as much as New Zealanders can make. So you might think that everyone should switch to PET for all their plastic packaging, but you can't make everything out of PET. So if, for example, you tried to make an ice cream container out of PET, you'd need it to be really thick. Um, which would be a waste of resource because overall we're trying to reduce our footprint. So the next challenge for New Zealand will be to start recycling other types of plastic. So
So number two will be good, things like milk bottles. Um, there's a little bit going on already, but we need to scale that. And then to try and persuade consumers, communities, manufacturers to focus on the ones that we can recycle before we move on to more exciting solutions that might roll out in the future. You've also said we need to engage society to address consumption. Yes. Do you mean quantity of consumption? I mean the whole, the, well, yes, quantity. Quality of consumption, quantity of consumption, how we're consuming. So, so it's again, it's a, it's a big, big social question. It's a big social behavioural picture that's looking at, well, yes, do we actually, when we purchase something, do we, what are the credentials that we're looking at? What's important to us? And how do we actually then project that in terms of our consumption habits? So it's, it's really a matter of actually thinking about how we consume. Juliet, have you got any suggestion to the government to affect consumption patterns in that way? So incentives, for example? The very last part of the report at the end of the year is going to be led by the psychologists who are interested in how to change behaviour. So they use examples like sun hats. So 20 years ago, kids didn't wear sun hats at school, but now they all do. So how do we get people to be more mindful of packaging in the same way that that behaviour changed? Much more complicated problem than sun hats, but at least there's some tools out there to understand how you get that sort of cultural transformation. When I became Mayor of Waitakere City, and founded, I guess, with a bunch of terrific councillors, the idea of an eco-city. We actually live totally by that agenda. I think more than any city around the Auckland region, Waitakere had a name for environmental good management, and that was backed by fantastic community involvement on our twin streams, saving water when the dams ran dry, no one saved, saved water more than Waitakere. So I honestly believe good leadership, education of a community, education of a nation will achieve what we set out to do. What about the attitude that we've taken to tobacco and just tax the hell out of it? <laughs> yeah, so that, we, we do the science advice, not the tax advice. <laughs> <laughs> So part of my role is to make sure that policy is informed by the evidence and that might be simple numbers from a recycling plant but it might also be much higher tech evidence so evidence based for new materials whether they really do compost whether they provide new solutions to present new solutions for packaging that um, that we could change the whole way packaging is done in New Zealand that would be on a much longer time frame to simple things like recycling. But whatever we do, we need an evidence base to make sure that when we change, we know we're changing in the right direction. One of the most exciting things about the project has been hearing all the new ideas out there that people are coming up with to solve our plastic problem. Lots of little ideas, some big ideas, and already at different time frames. So some of them are ready to go now, and others, like the work that's going on at Scion, um, are really ambitious and imagining a whole new future where most of the plastics are made from a new class of materials derived from plant waste. Plastics actually enabled an awful lot of things that we could do. So we wouldn't have got any spaceships up into, into, onto the moon without plastics for lightweight, strong, reliable um, material. Same with airplane flights. Flying around the world right now, you're flying in plastic pretty much. A bit of metal, a bit of other stuff, but mostly it's plastic and enabled by it. So that makes it cheaper to fly for, for the fuel side of things and easier able to get up on the up in the air. So plastics are really important for us and they're all around us and we've adopted them so fast because they're convenient, they're lightweight and they're effective at what they do. So transferring into bioplastics for this means we've got to go fast tracking through some of all those developments and finding the right places where bioplastics can substitute. Let's talk about bioplastics. What are they? Why are they called plastics at all. People muddle up plastics that can biodegrade, that can come from any source, with plastics that are made of biological materials. Um, so the Scion program is all about making sustainable plastics from 
any sort of biological materials, but wood would be a focus at SIA. Sustainable in the sense that they, they don't come from fossil fuels and also in the sense that they can biodegrade. So ideally they'd be plant-based in some way and also would biodegrade. Fundamentally you have two different ways of making plastics from petrochemical sources as we know it today or you can make it from renewable material and at Scion we use sugar out of trees for example we ferment that and turn that then into bioplastics so the base material does not come from out of the ground digging deep into the ground but we're using what has renewably grown and turn that into a plastic. Fossil fuels and fossil materials um, are actually old trees they're actually a, a material called lignin that holds the tree together and only that was hundreds and hundreds and thousands of millions of years ago and it got compressed in the earth and then we got petrol and we got coal out of it for example. Whereas today's world what we're doing is we're taking, so when we, when we use those into petroleum plastics and then degrade them we add CO2 to the atmosphere, new CO2. When we use the bioplastics, we're actually using the material, the CO2 that's in the atmosphere to make our bioplastics. So we're not adding to the whole system. And that's why they're better for the environment. It's, and as well as that, we can also manage what we do with them and how we get rid of them at, at the end of life. Traditionally, with fossil fuels, we always looked at the economic side of, of things. Um, I can grow the GDP of an economy by extracting more and more finite resources. But that will come to an end, that, that has to come to an end. So now with, with bioplastics, it is about how can I extract renewable resources in, in a sustainable way to manufacture a product that in, in the overall life cycle is um, benefit to the, to the environment, but also to the, to the economy. So it can't be just one or the other. One of the technologies that Scion's working with is how can we take all of the waste on the plantation floor, the slash that people have had problems with, with flooding, for example, around Gisborne, and we can make a mobile unit and we can actually turn that into precursor materials and precursor chemicals. We can also take the fibre and the biomass from it and use that to then f make sugars and that the microbes can use to make plastics and go through the circle again. So it's a way of clearing away the waste and giving a reason for people to capture that waste rather than leave it in the forest. We are now just in the first year of a multi-year, multi-million dollar project called Bark Bar Refinery to have the underutilized source bark in New Zealand where we have millions of tons either lying on the ground or left in the forest and to use material out of bark in polymer applications. One example of the bioplastics we are working here are polyhydroxyalkanates. And this is a very, very fascinating group of um, polymers produced by microbes. We store glycogen as energy, plants store starch as energy, and these microbes store these bioplastic polymers. And so what we do is we have CO2 and water, it's in the atmosphere around us, the CO2 is increasing all the time, half the problem. Uh, and trees capture both of those through photosynthesis. And then trees make sugar, essentially. And then the microbes come along and say, yum, sugar, I store up my energy for later. Uh, so I make these bioplastics. And then what we do is we take those bioplastics out of the microbes and we make our substitute plastic materials. And then the advantage is because microbes make them, they can also degrade them because they're used to reusing them the way we, we reuse glycogen and plants use starch. And so the microbes can come along, degrade them right back to CO2 and water, which the tree can capture again, and we can go round and round in that cycle. The big science opportunity now is how do you redesign? How do you use new materials in that setting up of, of new products? Um, recycle technology. Um, we haven't been very good with, with our recycling rates, so there's a big challenge for, for innovation and, and science opportunities to make recycling better. And then here, what, what I'm personally really, really excited about is that element of renew. So can we bring in bio-based materials, bio-based polymers, also set up for either compostability or recyclability or reusability, 
into, into the whole system without extracting uh, new materials. In New Zealand, when we look at or when we think of biomass, we pretty much think of trees. Um, but that's not all there is. There are also different materials such as from algae or from, from horticulture, viticulture types of uh, industries. One way of using biomass waste is where we combine them with biopolymers through our extruder capability into filaments. Our extruder technology has actually allowed us to use a number of biomass waste such as grape skin. So what we are doing is uh, compounding the skin from the wine grapes with a bioplastic into these net clips. And in New Zealand, you're using nets to protect the ripening grapes and non-degradable net clips are used for that purpose. And these nets get rolled up, the clips will break, fall to the ground and ultimately will break down into microplastics. We've got here now a much better option where these clips will ultimately uh, biodegrade. This is the hard piece of Australasia's only Dinsertco certified biodegradation and compostability facility. So what we can do here is, under absolutely set conditions, we test the biodegradability of different polymers and different materials. So it's really critical to do this in a evidence-based and repeatable way to ensure that results are absolutely reliable. So what companies and our own material can do is come to us to test to international standards the degradability of, of their materials. And the other advantage is you can do it in different media. You can do it in soil, you can do it in salt water and seawater or in fresh water. What we want to make sure is that the material that we are using, developing and testing with our partners actually breaks down but then gets converted to CO2 and water. The important part of this process comes in, especially when we talk about microplastics. The, the issue with, with microplastics or, or what we can see in the environment is these are polymers that have been broken down or that are breaking down but they are only breaking down in smaller and smaller pieces. And that is absolutely detrimental to the environment, but also to, to sea or, or human life. The definition of a microplastic is a piece of plastic that's less than five millimetres in size. So these are uh, split into two types, primary and secondary microplastics. So your primary microplastics are those that are made to be that small. So things such as um, what they used to use in a personal cleansers and things, the, the, to exfoliate, um, or the nurdles, which are the pre-production pellets that are used to make bigger things. So they'd be considered primary microplastics. Secondary microplastics are pieces of plastic smaller than five millimetres that have um, been formed by the breakdown of larger items. So this could be a drinks bottle that's broken down in the environment, or the fibres from your synthetic clothing. So we've got some bits of plastic here that were collected from um, a beach in Wellington. These will keep on breaking down and once they fall within that five millimetre size they will continue to break down. So at the end of last year we received a five-year grant from um, the government to look at the impacts of microplastics on New Zealand's ecosystems. The project is aiming to look at the plastics around New Zealand, how much there are, what sorts there are, and their effects on the environment and the animals and plants that live within the environment as well. In the marine systems, we'll be looking at what settles on the different types of plastic. So depending on what settles, the plastic may have a different level of risk that might affect our fisheries industry. For New Zealand, the exciting thing is that we can actually turn around and look after ourselves a bit more. We don't have to import our plastics, we can manage it ourselves. Because right now, with packaging for example, 50% of it comes in from overseas and products we buy. And when we manufacture here, we have selling our products overseas with packaging. And so we can start to really change the view that New Zealand, hey, it's a very complete society and bioplastics are a positive thing for people buying our products.
So here's our report. There's far too many recommendations because it's such a complex problem, mm. but we've um, managed to put them into different parts um, so that it fits into our vision of the future. So we've already talked about the data mm. and how little we've got and how we're going to need that mm. to make sure all the new policies work. We need to clean up the environment and look at what materials we're using so mm. they don't damage the environment. Gather up all the innovation out there mm. and make best practice, standard practice, to start using all those great ideas. And probably most importantly, change our relationship with plastics and come up with a new vision of how we might mm. be in a few years if we adopt all these recommendations. The thing that really um, comes through for me um, is, well, firstly, actually how complex it is. I think people yeah. think it's just that there's one type of plastic and it's just about recycling it. but. But that also, um, there are some amazing ideas and innovations out there and there is no lack of enthusiasm. It's just about us bringing it all together. So um, this has given us, this has given us what we need to just get on with it. There were a few things that I just didn't anticipate with this job and, and one of them was just the sheer scale of letters that I've received from children. And there is a consistent theme and that it's plastic. You know, at first it was single-use plastic bags and we moved to ban those in large part because I just saw the strength of feeling that sat behind it. And now it's straws, it's cutlery, it's the presence of plastics in our everyday life and kids are so aware of it, uh, as they should be. So for me, this is about tackling a, a generational issue. We've had a world without the convenience of plastic entering into almost every element of our daily lives. And now it's about trying to return to that world. The plastic problem is huge and it's going to take effort from all sectors of society to solve it. The good news is that in our report there's lots of recommendations that we can start chipping away at the problem from all different angles and we need to find best practice that's already being used and make it standard practice. That's the short term. In the long term we really need to build on the evidence base find the size of the problem, see which policies are working, and draw on our science community to find new materials, new solutions, and our business community to come up with new business models to use those materials. The most important message that I would have for people in New Zealand or anywhere else is to remember that every single day we live, we make some impact on the planet, and we have a choice as to what kind of impact we make. And if we think about the consequences of even the little choices we make, what do we buy? Where did it come from? How was it made? Did it harm the environment? Did it result in cruelty to animals like the factory farms? Is it cheap because of child slave labour somewhere else? Have we taken the environmental consequences into account when we think about the price? And then if people the first hundreds and thousands and millions, but ultimately billions of people are making ethical choices, we start moving towards a better world.